Hello everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. Hopefully my voice is loud and clear. The title of tonight's episode is Finding the True Value of Civilization. And so it's a topic where I often speak about, but I want to hold it in a new light today. You see, the eyes of the future generations is the value of the lifetime of temporary human beings. When there are discussions about a sort of metaphysical eternal position, those fall in short to what we have access and what we have access the only way the human being can in some sense touch eternity is through what we leave behind this is why i give these talks this is why i, I find that any writer philosopher communicator on this planet that was their effort underneath all their inspirations and ambitions they were like there's a world here and it shall come When you study what 8 billion plus human beings are doing on this planet, you see what is inspiring their movements and actions is language. It's programs of language behind their eyes. These programs of language allow the world to be in a certain way and even, uh, how can I tell you? Language is filtering the world. We have experiences as human beings. Through those experiences, certain realities and memories and images are attained. These memories and images uh, have, a, in some sense, a subjective duplicate in regards to a symbol. So what that means is, for example, I see the objectivity of a tree in front of me. But suddenly that object has become a tree, has become uh, filled with meaning, and in some sense a sort of subjective point linked with an objective point being one moment. And so I find that the human intelligence appears that way. When you go and look at people walking in the street, their entertainment, what is entertainment? Entertainment is a new story, is a new story. That is what the entertainment industry is looking for. And so the reason is, is through an intense process of objective evolution towards a subjective position, we have reached a point where the only way the subjective individuality of the person can evolve is through the embrace of a collective movement. You see, in my mind, it's so easy to be yogic and think, oh, everything is one, nice, oneness. Everything, the universe is one field of intelligence, yay. <laughs> but, 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 in actuality, the experience is chaotic. The experience of non-duality is not for every mind, because most minds are, uh, they are, their foundations are in individual existence. You wouldn't know what to do if you went beyond your individual existence. What that means is, imagine being in a moment where no language can, no words can contain that experience of the world. So what I find is going to happen to civilization is that it is not being valued truly. We don't care. It, it's like in the background of our mind that we're all somehow, you know, here together. But we are living our individual lives. And there is a, the whole issue is that there is an inefficiency. For me, there is no good and bad. There's just efficiency and inefficiency in regards to where the species is heading. Now, where the species is heading, in some sense, some of it has to do with new ideas. Some of it has to do with ancient ideas. And some of it has to do with modern ideas that are as temporary as the people who carry those ideas in their attention. Without attention, the world will not be lit up, you know? There's this very incredible philosophical saying. where it says if a tree falls in a forest, does anybody hear it if there's nobody there? Did the tree ever fall? 
and so what is not in our domain of awareness comes across as unknown and what is unknown cannot be made we cannot take responsibility for you see the value of conscious existence is not that you can do anything in this world <laughs> that's like more good marketing for children this life is a series of complex processes and these series of objective complex processes are being simplified by your intelligence into modes of meaning into modes of image for me, life is pretty much data processing. The based on the and what kind of processing? A processing of what kind of data? Before, back in the day, it was only limited to sensory data. What I mean by like by that? That means the caveman was just like playing around with objectivity. It did not. It had not perhaps even established a sort of sophisticated consciousness to the sense of self as a sense of other. You see, that is, that is something that eventually happens in the lifetime of the person. It's the same way as the child believes the world is nice and suddenly sees cruelty and the whole character of the individual is transformed. This is why, I believe it or not, uh, you got to walk in the good neighborhoods of life. And you got to extend those neighborhoods. What that means is we got to see what works and then increase it pretty much. Now, I noticed this. How can you, in some sense, bring a collective vision to creatures that each, wanted, each wants to do what they want to do in this life? It doesn't matter whether it's a, a secular person, if it's religious person, spiritual person. Everybody is obsessed with their sense of self. The spiritual person is just calmer. He's looking internally for the sense of self. Everybody else has external demands. Now, I feel what's going to happen is the way we can truly have an impact in our lifetime as human beings is not by seeing the change instantly, but by planting seeds. And in some sense, like that wise saying goes, we plant trees that we will not be sitting under their shade. That means we, 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 we structure, we at least can create the foundations of how the future generations open their eyes. But this has to occur through a total new uh, interpretation of the existential dimension. What that means is we have separated our nature, uh, ourselves from nature, and then we have separated our, ourselves from each other, and then we're looking at the world and we're like, why such chaos and loneliness? In this life, you got to learn to navigate. This is something they don't teach. That life is not meant to have one belief system, cannot rule all moments of life, cannot define all moments of life. Even when you look at uh, Abrahamic religions, you see, uh, it's not that I want to speak about religion. It's just that religion has, 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 has a sort of framework to itself that it touches the metaphysical through restriction. For me, I have gone to many, many, many re religious denominations. Um, not religious, I'll say it like this. I've gone to many people, many certain priests, monks, mullahs, you know, I've talked to them. And I've asked them what the soul is. And I realized the incredible restriction, you know, religion has on the notion of a deeper being. What that means is it's as if in the religious mindset, if when you go to find, truly figure out what the soul is that you have and that's, said, that's revealed in Revelation, like it's said in the, you know, where there are beings are acknowledged as souls, you know. And so when you go look at, it, at that soul, you begin to see it's as if they're, they're, the response is given is that it is unknown. Do you see? I'm saying whatever belief system we have, we cannot avoid the unknown dimensions of our experience. So too much fixation on a certain ideology will make you miss out on the experiential life. Okay? Look at this picture I've chosen for this talk. You know what this is? This is when human beings have messed up on Earth. This is their backup plan. A ring of Elysium trying to create a world that once when we had it, we did not, we were not aware we had it. That is the issue. Don't you feel many people on this planet, they don't know their opportunities until they pass them by, or they don't know their mistakes until they've made them. 
you see, because various worlds are colliding with one another throughout the day. And I try to keep my attention singular. What that means is, <laughs> I there was a time, guys, now I'm sitting here with a sort of kind of contentment with deep metaphysical ideas, but there was a time where that contentment was not there and I felt life had kind of opened me to my own intuitive interpretation of the world as if life was saying, okay, you don't need beliefs, you don't need, it's like after I, I, I studied, not studied, like like sit there with the book and notes and stuff, I mean, I, I write a lot, but <laughs> but I'm telling you, I looked at the philosophical constitution, the ideological constitution of every belief system. And I realized something about language. It's as if I went to see where my truth is. I noticed something that many, a, pl a place no, not many people start. You see, if, I, if somebody tells you you're wrong, okay, the mentality and the e egoic construct with the person could be like, okay, I don't know if I'm wrong. I'm going to go give it a try, da, 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 right? So the person goes forth because experience, the unknown dimensions of experience have more to offer than just an idea on what will happen. <clears throat> However, the revelation of language's hollowness is the chaos, cha the, cha the kind of like an apocalypse that will uh, make us aware of our true natural being. And it's going to be intense. You know why? Because our whole societies and civilizations are based on noise and movement. But the awareness of what awareness is and how awareness is being the moment, that is, has nothing to do with motion, has nothing to do with sound. That means people should ask the mystical riddle, the spiritual riddle like this, where they ask themselves, What is a truth that has nothing to do with sound and movement? And you will see there is a simultaneity with the stillness of attention and with how existence is being. You tap into your existential nature. But because you're, most people, when they go looking for their existential nature, they get, they get sold by a thought. You see, this is why it's just in our nature. People, when they get challenged, they have more respect for them, that person than someone who just agrees. Let me tell you why. Because worlds are being pushed and progress is being made. And it doesn't mean every person's lifetime must be a happy victory or life will have no color. That's the danger of the utopia and the danger of the dystopia. You know, that's why the world cannot be truly evil. Because if it is, it will lose its meaning. And, it, it, you know, imagine the evil person killing is right there about to kill the last person that's good. And then all the armies of evil shout at their commander who's about to kill this good, the last good guy in existence. And they say, don't, because if you kill the good, we will no longer be bad. And it can even occur vice, vice versa, the opposite way. So what I'm trying to tell you is that this life works with dualities. There's wheels. There, it, like when you go look at philosophy, soon you will tap in. Like before I would just see the words of philosophers. Then I got to see visions. You see, words are imagery. Like when I'm speaking, I don't know what kind of audiences are getting drawn to these talks. I'm kind of like lighting a flame and I'm trying to see what 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 it draws but at the same time the value of civilization is the value of the greatest self and the greatest self is the witness of chaos and order in the same moment I want you to imagine, just imagine, be playful right now with thoughts. And just imagine, let's say we, me and you right now were intense Buddhist monks. <laughs> and so we believed in a reincarnation. 
we had this notion, okay, there's something here that it's like take something from each life and continues to the next, kind of this wheel that we're, this hamster's moving in, this eternal hamster is moving into this temporary, manif eternal temporary manifestation. Now, I want to tell you, imagine that you, we entertain the notion of reincarnation and we suddenly see, holy shit, 8 billion beings are endlessly, it's as if it's no longer like drops, people are no longer being acknowledged like drops, their consciousness is being acknowledged like rivers with no end. We would wonder about how our lifetime is going to affect our next birth if we were Buddhists. Trust me, Buddhists think that way. <laughs> and so they, it's very, it's, it's kind of hilarious. Every person is painting their own picture of time. This is why I think everybody has an ability, uh, or in some sense I, I term it, everybody is an advanced communicator and their own unique advanced communicator. You are, an you are an opportunity of the cosmos in history to be able to translate inner phenomena into the external through various technologies of writing, speech, movement, and whatnot. But when we wonder about what we are, what we really have to say to the temporary world, we see that we must ask it a question. Sometimes truth is not an answer. Our species is looking for truth like it's an answer somewhere. Truth is a question. And in that question, worlds of responsibility must be ignited. Collective responsibility. Because it's cooler that way. <laughs> It's as if some guy came in the UN is like, guys, I understand nations will never get along and we each have our unique cultural programs and da 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 da. But what if, what if we just started creating a small community or a global community with new values? That means we can always add a new dimension. This is what people forget. This is why so many people, they're encompassed by fear and they're encompassed by desire and various forces that overwhelm them and they give in to it. You know why? The easiest way to handle that is look at it as a designer, not as a warrior fighting evil. <laughs> look at it as a designer. And I'll tell you why, why it's important to look at it as a designer. Because the designer looks at data and wonders what data is missing and what data is not missing. When you have fear, there is something missing in the moment. There is a denial of your attention to truly confront what is in the moment. And in some sense, our species, the masculine energy is defined. It's defined by this. Do you know how many of our ancestors ran into war? They were like, literally, the dude was a baker, and they're like, it's wartime, and he's like, okay, baking skills have to become working war skills right now. There was, uh, in ancient Greece, I guess, there was the School of Athens. The School of Athens was in some sense a great hall where the greatest philosophers came to, in some sense, uh, uh, it was kind of like clash of the titans, you know, of, of, of the deepest thoughts. That means the School of Athens was like the, the peak of like deep thought, or at least an institution that had that aim. And so, of course, they held geometry in high regard, and there are stories that there were certain students of in this school of Athens that there was there was how can I tell you? It's as if they they went. There were some rooms that had guards, and some of the students wa wondered why. And one of the students peeked, and he and at that time it was like a perfect cube in the room, and the guard uh, the the head of the school uh, whoever it was back then. I don't know, it's one of these guys, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, some of these, you know. But, but the whole thing, 
uh, I'm pretty sure it's Plato. It's Plato's kind of uh, Plato's mind had a geometrical relationship with divinity, which is which is very rare. It, the ge geometry right now, believe it or not, nobody cares. In the dismissal of modern art, we are forgetting what art is carrying. Anyways, so some one kid, one guy in the school of Athens peeks into this room and instantly the guards kill him, but he sees what's in the room. And he sees a perfect, spe a perfect sphere, a perfect cube, a perfect triangle. And so the headmasters believed people's, the students' minds were not ready to even see that sort of perfection. You know, they, they acknowledge geometry as a higher technology in, in some sense in regards to unraveling the mysteries of manifestation. Manifestation doesn't mean just matter. It means all phenomenology in the present moment. Okay? <clears throat> that's active, you know? If it's, if it's phenomena that's inactive, it comes to us as non-existential. Like the dude thought he was on Earth, then realized the, the whole Earth is on a giant turtle's back swimming in space. <laughs> so, is life just about painting new pictures, or does it require a greater application? So how would this application occur? I got a great, in, in this kind of, the, the Rubik's Cube of this civilization, I was trying to solve it sometimes. How can I tell you, my, for me, my greatest victories have been to attempt what has never been attempted. It just gives meaning to my life, to wonder about what is behind what I'm seeing. And it's not that it's, it's just, um, trust me, you cannot be too artificial in this life. The greatest judgment comes from nature's forces in which you're either in alignment with or not. You see, the guy thought he had bad karma. He looked at the gods and the lords of karma and he said, Why? Why are you guys doing this to me? Yeah. <laughs> and the lords of karma were like, Chill, man, chill. <laughs> we're not doing this to you. You are not seeing the world you're, you're alive in to even properly walk into it walk in it. There's two ways Mr. Within will say you can walk into this world. Uh, walk in this world. Not into it. Well, how you can journey through this lifetime. And I believe it. the human consciousness oscillates. Oscillates between these two. And the way it is, is that you are a physical body which your brain is projecting a hallucination of some sorts of a free will. And so you are the illusion of mind in a universe that was only atoms floating in space. The other approach is rather than being a body that's howling a mind around, you are a mind that is projecting a body. This mind has no definitions, it is the definer. This attention has no barriers, it has no, no words can contain the purity of existence. That's its incredible genius this is why and some poets tapped into this when their when their uh existential self-inquiry became deep to a point where they could not resist their true nature it was as if uh, flows of the world suddenly opened up to the being i personally i don't want to say it like it's i don't want to make it too kind of objective but i could i, I will say that it's not just human beings in this planet uh, and it's not other like phenomena, other things we can put in a story. There's just certain f rhythms and flows and waves of, uh, of phenomena that occur that they, they become coincidental. It's kind of like a Venn diagram in that middle part. So throughout the day, you will find various waves approach. Sometimes I've had, like for example, three ideas uh, approach simultaneously. When I say approach, is because, you see, for me, Imagine the subjective realm is a vast landscape. I am not my thoughts. I am seeing them. And once you see them for a little bit, you will see, you will discover the animative force of attention. So you will realize the secret of the meaning of life is in how your attention is being the moment. 
So once human beings have, uh, oh, that thing I want to say about Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson said the thing about individual. You gotta, you gotta start from the individual, and in some sense work towards the collective. That means we can't all save the whole world, but we can at least begin making each each of our own lives efficient. But how would the, our lives become efficient? I feel human beings. It doesn't matter uh, if you're in a community or not. It doesn't matter if you're a monk in, in wherever or something. But there is some level of a new responsibility being evoked in our species and that that new level of responsibility is that okay you are alive you're in this world you wake up in the day you have you have a certain existence your free will has a certain reach your free will has a certain manifest ability to do some things okay and so how the moment can be divided is first consider that life is a great work what i mean by that is your lifetime is something great that you are consciously doing. This is very important. You become conscious of yourself. And it, to be conscious of an elusive self uh, uh, is much better than to be not conscious of any self and just be an unconscious movement. But you know why? Because we evolved from animals. And the difference between us and animals is that animals, it's as if like uh, some mystics would say their soul has free, will, has free will over their physical body, but their minds or the attention of the souls that they are has not given themselves the permission to be, to see the other. We saw beyond ourselves. And this is why we look at like farm animals and are like, holy shit, these guys have no idea where they are. <laughs> <clears throat> so this great work is pretty much from the moment you have existed till the moment you will leave existence. And when I say leave, leave it completely. You know, we all have to leave. Our moments someday and it's nothing to be afraid of the best thing you can do is make it humorously poetic <laughs> it's like oh no there's extinction and you know death and non-existence oh no you know <laughs> what you do is as certain Zen masters would say, you climb the mountain by starting at the top, you acknowledge the end, then you begin anew. Because if the end uh, puts you into a submission of the forces of your moment rather than the force of your free will in every moment of being, your free will should in some sense stand taller than your ego. You must realize beyond your beliefs, there's mountains you can move. So this great work becomes the work of your lifetime and you'll, you go into, you'll go into some peaceful moment where you're alone by yourself with this world. It's not that every moment we should just be with people. Sometimes we have to be with our world to see it to see if it is dying or if it is in some sense alive, to see if civilization will be something that thousands of years from now our grandchildren will look and say, yes, they did their job. Or would we just be in the slumber of a sort of selfish individuality until all the drops have evaporated and they have not become a river that in some sense has an elegance of a higher dimension? We must be inspired, but we must not lose the value of the being, you know, of how we're being. So imagine each person on the planet, they just said, okay, forget everything I'm being told. Forget everything. I don't want to say everything. <laughs> like some younger audience might be listening to this, but I'm saying, like, take it in, take what I'm saying in context or you will be hearing a different talk. Eight billion people, each one for a moment stops what they're doing, stops all their programs, all the programs that, all the applications that are open in their attention. And they just look, they just look at life. They just watch how it's naturally here. Most people feel the, the greatest ability of the intellect is like some abstract multidimensional geometric conceptualization of a sort of 
uh, symbol of reality, a representation of reality, but it is not so. The, the, sm the I find the most intelligent beings on this planet are the ones that see what, the, what's going on in this planet. That means they are not convinced too early to even be, it's as if some, the guy says, the guy goes to, imagine, <laughs> imagine there's this kind of like therapy thing, and this guy goes to the therapist and he's like, hey man, I'm depressed, I'm stressed, what do I do, I hate myself, you know? And the, th and the therapist is like, how do you know you're stressed and depressed? And then the, the patient's like, whoa, <laughs> what do you mean, how do I know? I'm just stressed and depressed, man, I'm sad, nothing's working. And then the therapist says again, how are you so sure? Explain it to me. And as the person comes to explain their stress and depression, they will instantly become aware of a macro context and their stress and depression will feel an infinitesimal. It's as if when your ancestors had to grab metal swords and run at night and defend like their kingdoms, you know, it's as if now like a person like, you know, cyberbullying. Okay, I understand there are fragile minds, but let us not forget the strength of the species. You see, so it's the it's the context you walk in and in, in every every day has there's a new light to how the experience unravels. So the great work will occur through people wondering about life. And then they're going to ask themselves, okay, I saw this world. And it's going to come to you as either good or bad or something. Believe it or not, there's people on this planet right now loving how this world is existing. And there are people right now on this planet hating how this world is existing. And that's the fascinating show. This is why it, when we really look at what's going on on our planet, it's a war of language. It's a pro programs are at war, programs inspired out of uh, genetic, out of the, like not just only the program of the DNA, but in some sense the genetical program of the being, but also all that the genetical programs access to free will allows. And the issue is people, it's becoming easy for them to forget who they are. It's becoming easy for them to let go, let go of all that life has built so far. You know, they, there's this saying, they say, I mean, it's not a saying, it's pretty much kind of like an observation, but they say like a building, <laughs> uh, it takes years for great, like imagine a cathedral, I don't know, it would take like a long time to have a cathedral made back in the day. But in an instant, it can be broken. This is why it's always easier to break something than build it. That means with one press of a button, there could be this post-apocalyptic situation where human beings are kind of pushed back towards savageness, animalistic savageness. We will see it would not be easy to recover. So what that means is there's a value here that must not be ignored. The great work has an inner side and an outer side. The outer side of your great work is you will decide upon certain values and pretty much act on them. That's it. Externally, there's only, believe it or not, it comes down to do, like there's two options. You either care for it or you don't. And it's so easy not to care. It is so easy not to care. It is literally as easy as literally moving your attention to something else. That is how easy it is. And when I was in downtown Toronto, uh, I would have moments where I would be rushing to, because I was late, but then there would be, in some sense, a person kind of begging for change. And, you know, it brought a tear to my eye. It brought a tear to my eye because I was too busy to even see if I had change. And I realized it's it, the world society nowadays. It's, it's a savage place, I will tell you. Every parent, look at your child and tell them, be careful and study society. Because it is not all truth. It is not all clarity. It is not all sunshine. You know, when, when the light of the moon penetrates our eyes. This great work, I find, it will open up through an artistic approach for people. And what that means is you will pretty much give yourself freedom of not thinking you're judged before you do something. It's so relaxing. It's incredibly, it's like a, a judgment is 
an unnecessary weight on the mind. Sometimes judge, certain judgments are important. You know, you got to be street smart when it comes to existential reality. <laughs> That means you gotta you gotta understand how the world moves and move with it, you know. Becoming comfortable with the known, becoming comfortable with the unknown, and then the grand exploration begins when the civilization is fearless. It is fearless. Eventually human beings they will attain a sort of emotional state where they will feel it makes more sense to evolve a collective system that embodies everybody than to just evolve an individual. So eventually through individuals opening their eyes, they begin opening the eyes of the world. And it requires every contribution. Sometimes it's like there's not enough time to doubt yourself. And that is, that is the only thing I feel that has value. Believe it or not, it's strange, but many people live for worlds they never see. Parents live for the greatness of their children. Those children live for the greatness of their world. The greatness of their children and the greatness of their children. And it's as if, like, when you're planning things for the future, could there be a potential that the present will be ignored? I have talked to many people in this lifetime, and it's so easy to know when, when someone's attention is in the room. Someone could, someone could be in the room, but their attention could be somewhere else. And if their attention is not on that point, it doesn't matter how loud you speak in their ear, it's going in their subconscious. That means they're subconsciously hearing you, you know. <laughs> I feel every person, civilization, will get to such an innovative level where every human being will leave behind a library a library of experiences and viewpoints that they have seen in this life. I feel it is crucial because, th let me tell you, our history is only thanks to scribes. <laughs> These dudes got no credit, but they managed to share, take, allow something to enter the future. You see, our inefficiency is just, are, are we allowing great technologies to enter the future? Or are we creating challenges that it's as if the work of the future generations is constantly becoming harder and harder because the more mistakes we make, the more messed up the world is, but they're born in the world accepting it since childhood as a natural loving place. So it's as if lovers are being torn by machines. It's as if, how can a person care for their life, but not care for the life of the world? I, 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 I don't understand this. Eight billion people. They are, it's as if, like, why are we alive then? If it's just a sort of push and pull, you know? Free will is, is the last hope. Free will, just the, the preservation, this is the last institu institution that has not been attacked and has not been, in some sense, penetrated. But it, it is under attack probably in the next, like, 200 years or something, you know? Let me tell you why. Because your free will right now has a sort of natural origin, at least. Your free will has a natural constitution to it, you know? You listen to your breath a little bit, you will realize who you are. But I'm telling you, you are, you are with the human being in 2019, still natural constitution. The external world, however, is changing. And the, when the external world changes, guess what? The inner world will change. They take you. It doesn't matter how many roses you hold. If you're standing beside a dumpster, you will, it's like you're not just going to smell roses. 
And similarly, the external environment is changing. And so Friedrich Nietzsche, this German philosopher, he said, God is dead. And we killed him. He means the, the, the innovation, uh, I shouldn't say innovation, but the intellectual approach uh, so, so, uh, separated free will from... Uh, it, uh, It's as if what was before something seen as the divine will became the individual will. But then the individual will looked at everything else and was like, this stuff is too big. It got overwhelmed. And because it got overwhelmed, it decided to stay in the cave of the sense of self. And this is why evolution has been slow for the species. But anyways, to continue, the external environment is becoming more technological. Right now, technology is in front of us. I'm speaking through a laptop in front of me. But in the future, if technology somehow links with the person's brain, the person's desires are too technological and they forget their natural humanity, then free will is under attack. The last natural institution. It's as if before... You, you look at any <clears throat> uh, sort of legal constitution, you just look at the constitution of how existence is being you. So nature could, in some sense, I don't know, could get trapped. Like individual free will that's identifying with nature could go an incredibly technological dimension. But I feel before it truly transitions into a technological domain, there's going to be a sort of chaotic resistance. You know? It's as if uh, some people might not know this concept, but did you know there's something called divine fear? Divine. Divine fear. Divine fear is when something has been seen that is inevitable for including for all the possibilities of just existence, not just the possibilities of them themselves. That means as if the, the professor who had worked for his whole life writing uh, incredible like writings or something, you know, having so many degrees in a sophisticated kind of search, he suddenly sees a meteor is hitting Earth and the Earth is going to be destroyed and a sort of strange fear, not a fear for self, but a fear for the world arises, you know? There is this argument that we are, we are only individually conscious creatures because to truly confront our collective essence is just overwhelming. So as the person discovers a sort of presence to themselves beyond personality, that natural presence will envision, it's as if your eyes will be freed. Your eyes will be freed from having the world chain you conceptually. Yeah, I feel good about that sentence. Passion is a force that will arise once there is mindfulness and observance and alertness of the present moment. Once you find that, I don't want to call it neutral, but believe it or not, it has no quality. It's an attributeness, attributeless stillness and silence of your being. Once you just remain there, then your attention recalibrates. It's as if before you identify, you watch. 
it's like when you're in a moment before you just react to the moment uh now imagine you so whatever happens you just watch it's as if for a couple seconds you see what is going on and then and then rather reaction becomes conscious action so trust me we are data processors and we process data uniquely and this data has uh has an incredible value every eyes like every pair of eyes that has existed has had a value, but many have been gone in history silently. There have been many great writers that have never been seen. Do you know? It's kind of like a, I, I say to people, when you really truly read history, you need a tissue box. They need to give history books to kids with a tissue box because you will begin to see what may seem unnecessary but had to happen you would see the defeat of civility many times you would see hardship unimaginable and you would ask yourself oh my god this world is so chaotic yet what gives the order a direction and the most beautiful thing about it is, believe it or not, I'll tell you, um, one of my favorite shows is, I say this to people, and, you know, it's this Japanese kind of uh, anime show. Uh, and, of course, I, I write scripts often, so I analyze stories. And <clears throat> I'll tell you this. In that story, there was a character named Commander Erwin. He, this Commander Erwin was literally, he had to go to this untrained kind of army that was left, and he had to tell them that they all had to ride to their death because they had to be some sort of, okay, this is getting too complex, but let me say it like this. this, this okay, think of it this way. This general <clears throat> commander finds himself in front of his army men who are new soldiers and they're all paralyzed by a fear that they will die anyways in this human extinction scenario in the story. And so Commander Ervin tells them, this is our last operation. We march at the enemy, something like that, you know? And so their enemy, of course, in the story are these unimaginable chaotic giants that eat them, you know, eat people. It's, uh, of course, it's a, a Japanese creative story. I find it to be an incredible story. But anyways, so <laughs> Commander Irvin says this is our last operation. One of the soldiers, after Commander Irvin has said the full thing, full briefing, looks at him and says, Commander, and he's shocked. He's, he's so, he, there's an incredible fear in him. And he says, are you saying that we're all riding to our deaths? Comm the commander looks at that scared soldier and says, yes. He's in Japanese says so and try to run away uh, uh, to fight in our last moments of existence and the commander says soga and then the commander sees the fear in the minds of his like in the minds of the soldiers and he looks at him and he says whether you run on your horses we all will die for meaning and so it's as if his soldiers, he, from that hopeless, paralyzed state of fear his soldiers were in, he in some sense raises them, raises them to a state where it's as if the, he, the commander Irving's telling him, you're not fighting an enemy, you're raging against the, this existence and the cruelness of this world with your free will, your free will is marching. Even though everything seems empty and hollow, but you march, the free will is here, you march. And so it's an incredible scene as the story goes. And of course, they, they pretty much all die. And Commander Irving is barely left alive, but he dies at the end too. But their whole strategy in the whole film was to create a sort of decoy so the main, you know, one of a, an elite soldier could like assassinate their main foe or something. It's an incredible show, Shingeki no Kyojin, Attack on Titan. And I believe that regardless of how this world plays out, trust me, it's a sort of game. Regardless of how this game plays out, 
do not forget the value of how your free will stands after four billion years of evolution. And this is why the world has meaning. Because there's meaning to be found and created. Truth is not something always to be found. It is something created with a balance of, in some sense, uh, a natural attention to objectivity and subjectivity beyond, beyond their containers. You breathe as a free moment before thought intervenes. And then the world is clear. There's no, there's literally no words. 